Well, dear friends, good evening. I didn't want to lose the opportunity to look at you all <laughs> because you will be the source of inspiration. Um, the topic tonight that I chose came about when I was writing recently, uh, last week, a chapter in one of my new books on uh, marriage, family, and parenting. And uh, this chapter was about parenting. And I began to reflect on issue of parenting and what are the most fundamental aspects of this task in life. We, of course, have to look at after our children physically. We have to feed them, make them comfortable, take care of them, make sure that they're healthy. And uh, we also focus on psychological, social, intellectual, emotional development of our children to a certain degree. We still are very uh, awkward at it and not doing very well, but at least we know that we have to do something. And then the area of uh, spiritual aspects of parenting is usually left very vague by majority of people is ignored by those who are not ignoring it they think that the spiritual training is the same as religious training which is not uh, spirituality is a part of religion, but uh, there are many people who are religious and not spiritual. So uh, spirituality has a, its own unique character and dimension. So as I reflect on that, the thought came to my mind that in our world today, we are all very busy. Our children are very busy and we ourselves are very busy. And, uh, and we are the lucky ones of the earth and we are busy. And then there are children and families that are caught in the clutches of uh, clutches of uh, violence and war like the masses of people that we see fleeing to Europe and trying to come to North America and so forth and we see how devastating life of humanity has become and then there are masses of people who are hungry, who are sick with diseases that can easily be prevented and treated, but they die. And on and on and on it goes. And humanity is so busy that it's not reflecting on what it is doing and what's going on. Abdul Baha said that in all affairs of life, we should be willing to sacrifice the most important for the more important, unimportant, and the less important, and the not important. Because in everyday life, Think of your life today. 
you will see that a number of issues have been before each of us. Some of them were not important. Some were somewhat important. Some very important. Some were very important. And usually there are one or two or the most important. And the style of life that we have in our world today, any part of the world, is as, is as such that does not allow us to focus on the most important. We usually focus at best on the very important. Usually we focus on things that, that are important or less important or not important. <coughs> And life is wasted in the process. So how do we focus on the most important while we are struggling with so many different things, including all of the emails that we receive, the uh, Facebooks that you look at, the, the uh, stupid uh, as that they come your way on and on and on. We become busy with so many things. And usually we miss the most important. Now, in order to focus on the most important, there are several steps that have to be taken. And I think best we can categorize them under three categories of issues. Solitude, meditation, and faith. Solitude means a conscious effort on our part, a conscious, deliberate effort on our part to stop ourselves from being focused on the more important and the important, the less important and the busy things of life and sound and uh, crisis of life. Put aside some time and free ourselves from those issues and go within ourselves. We still can be with everybody else, but we can be in a state of solitude. Okay? Solitude doesn't mean being alone. Solitude means going inward. And for a moment, not allowing the noise of the outside and the sights of the outside and everything that is outside to, to preoccupy us. We need that moment of solitude. And when we create that moment of solitude, then we enter the process of meditation a meditative process. Meditative process means at least two things. One is that we ask ourselves questions and try to find answers to them. Meditation one aspect of meditation and fundamental aspect of meditation is that you ask yourself a question. And depending on the kind of a question that you ask, you receive a certain answer. And therefore, it is essential that we focus on the most important issue. We ask ourselves the question, what is the most important issue that I should be 
focus on? What should I focus on? What should I think? How should I use my power of understanding at this moment by focusing on the most important issue? And when we do that, we begin to receive answers. And this is the process, actually, that arts and sciences develop. What scientists do and the artists do is put themselves in a condition, meditative condition, in a state of solitude, away from everything. They put themselves in a state of meditation and ask themselves the most important question before them. And then answers begin to come. And they are inspired, so to speak. Okay? Innovations happen. New ideas come about. New ways of living emerge. New image, emotions begin to stir in our heart that we weren't aware of. Them. And on and on. So, from the moment of solitude, which is detaching ourselves, we enter into the process, meditative process, which means that we begin to use our power of understanding to focus on the most important question. And usually when we do that, we realize that the most important question always is love. Love is the most important question. Okay. You cannot find any other issue that is as fundamental as love. Okay. So if you began to reflect and think about what is the most important issue today, and you have been watching television, and you have been seeing all of those refugees, then you begin to ask yourself, probably I should contribute something. Probably I should sacrifice something. Probably I should give. Probably I should move from that also to call a number of friends and sit and consult with them together and see what can we do? Is there anything we can do about this situation? And the, as we talk, new ideas begin to emerge. And as new ideas emerge, we begin to do new activities, begin to raise consciousness, begin to raise more funds begin to all kinds of things that we do. These are all different expressions of human love. Right? These are different ways we express love. Now, love is the medium of prayer. Prayer is a love talk. And therefore, if we are going to detach ourselves, put ourselves in a state of solitude, enter in the, into a meditative process, automatically we enter into a prayerful state. And, and the prayer, because you see, for the first time in history of religion, Prayer has emerged in a totally different uh, condition in our world. Prayer 
in other religions usually is asking for something, turning to a higher power and asking for something, which is fine. But there is also there is asking for forgiveness or asking for some bounty or for asking to uh, for healing or whatever, which is of, of course perfectly fine. But in the Baha'i faith, prayer moves beyond that. Prayer becomes the medium in which we become focused on the most important in our life. So I thought that it would be a good idea for, for a short while. We reflect on a prayer that all of you know and recite every day. And to see what that prayer is all about. And here I'm talking about a long obligatory prayer. Okay. The long obligatory prayer of Baha'u'llah, which is obligatory for us, which we have to say, okay. Baha'u'llah has been kind, he knows us, he knows we are lazy and busy. So he has given us, given us other versions of the prayer. But the long obligatory prayer is a very, very special prayer, unique prayer. This prayer, Baha'u'llah says that you should say it every 24 hours. When you find yourself ready, which means when you decide to put yourself in a state of solitude. When you begin to decide to separate yourself from the everyday busyness. Okay. And you're in a state of solitude and ready. And you begin your prayer. Now, Because prayer is a love talk, we need to speak a little bit about the nature of love. The fundamental characteristics of love is the process of moving from selfishness to selflessness. You cannot love if you're selfish. When the person is selfish, the only object of love that person has is himself or herself. Okay. And that doesn't become, doesn't transcend to interpersonal love. Okay. The secret of love is when we begin to let go of self, of ego, of the insistent self, nafsa <coughs> amore. We begin to let, let go of that self and begin to be willing to give ourselves to the other. You see, how do you fall in love? You fall in love in true sense when you say to the, your beloved, I forget about myself, I'm focused on you. Okay? Most, you know, a childish love or an adolescent love uh, is different. The adolescent love, the adolescent says, I love you. Because you are beautiful and you are successful and you are rich, so you can make me important. <laughs> I am important because I love this person. Okay? So that's not 
really a selfless love. It is you you are loving yourselves through that process. Okay, that's different from the true love. True love is when you love the other by sacrificing yourself, by letting go of your selfishness, okay? And by letting you go of selfishness, of course, means that we, we need to acknowledge our powerlessness, acknowledge <coughs> that we are fundamentally powerless, that we are fundamentally in need. that we cannot be self-sufficient, that we are a part of the whole, cannot be separated from the whole. So when you reflect on love as a process of move from selfishness <coughs> to Selflessness, <coughs> sorry about that, then the long obligatory prayer becomes very, very enlightening. How do we start long obligatory prayer? The first thing that the first play, you know, the segment, we uh, Turn to God and we say, O thou who art the Lord of all names and the maker of the heavens. Lord of all names. What does it mean? Names means everything that is created. Everything that is created, everything that exists, has a name. Okay? So when we say God is the Lord of all names, it means that God is the Lord of everything. Everybody and everything. Okay? And when we say God is the creator of the heavens, what is a heaven? Heaven is that ideal state and place that you are seeking, whatever you are seeking, you know. That ideal place is the heaven. So every ideal thing, every perfect state, every perfect condition is the heaven. The Bob said that everything attains its heaven when it reaches to the point of perfection. Okay? So, those are heavens. Perfect. The states of perfection. And God is the creator of all perfection. So, what we have done here we immediately have put ourselves in a state of humbleness. Because we are now relating to a reality that is the creator of everything and is the lord of everything. And is the creator of all perfection. So how do you relate with that entity, with that reality? You relate to that reality from the process of selflessness, right? So we go and say, what we are asking God to do? 
to make of my prayer a fire that will burn away the veils which have shut me out from that view. And the light that will lead me unto the ocean of thy presence. So we begin our prayers expressing two things, at least two things. One is that we realize that we are nothing in vis-a-vis -vis the creator of all heavens and the Lord of all things. <clears throat> we are nothing. And second, that we are the lover. We are the lovers of this reality. And we want to be connected in this with this reality. And we want to go to the presence of this reality. And there are a lot of things that is stopping us from this reality to being in the presence of this reality. And we are now begging and asking that we be helped to get connected with that object of ultimate love that we have. We begin our prayer with this combination of realization of our state of self and the realization of our profound love for that reality. Okay? And the prayer goes on. For example, later in the prayer, what we say, we say, for example, O thou, the desire of the world and the beloved of the nations. Isn't that interesting? To describe God as the desire of the world, which means all humanity is seeking God. Even godless people are in search of God. Everybody is searching for God. Everybody is seeking that. Everything that we do at fundamental level is aimed at reaching to that desire, the, the fundamental desire of our hearts. We're just not aware of it. So here, what Baha'u'llah does in the obligatory prayer Brings, puts us in a condition of meditation. We begin to meditate, to reflect, to think what the nature of the relationship of human beings is with God. That nature, that process, means that we are lovers of God, but we don't know how to express our love. You know, even in ordinary situation, when people fall in love, they have so much difficulty to tell each other that they love each other, right? How many people find it so difficult to express love to each other, to other people, even to spouses, and definitely to people that we don't know? We have a profound difficulty to express love. Okay? But we are lovers. We are all lovers. Actually, to be human is to, to be a lover. You cannot be a human being and not to love. You see. But it is it is learning how to love, which means learning how to let go of self. And, and therefore gaining insights into the realities of self. This process uh, is something that we are invited to do in the course of the obligatory prayer, this obligatory prayer. For example, we say, whatever is revealed by thee is the desire of my heart, and beloved of my soul. Do we really mean it? This is a reality. But 
But how do I say, repeat this every day? Okay? Why every day? Because it's difficult to achieve this state. You have to do it and do it and do it and do it to gradually move to that state, closer to that state. It's not something that comes like that. Okay? So that's the reason that we repeat these things every day. Because, you know, the funda- one of the fundamental characteristics of the lower self is that it is insistent. It repeats itself and repeats itself and repeats itself. You try to get away from it, and the thought comes, and the feeling comes, and the desire comes. And you cannot separate yourself from that which you do not like about yourself. How many of us have struggled with that process? Okay? Because our self is insistent. The lower self is insistent. Okay? It's like a child says, give me, give me, give me, give me. Okay? And it is a gradual process of freeing yourself from this insistent and the process to do it requires thinking, meditation, requires bringing to our attention the reality of who we are. For example, here we say, look not upon my hopes and my doings. Isn't that interesting? We, God, we ask God not to look upon our hopes and our actions. Nay, rather look upon thy will that had encompassed the heavens and the earth. By thy most great name, O thou Lord of all nations, I have desired only what thou didst desire, and love only what thou dost love. Every day when I say that, in his original Arabic, I say, really, have I done that? Immediately, my insistent self enters and says, are you sure? <laughs> are you sure that you don't desire anything but his desire and don't love anything but his love? Are you sure? You see, it, 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 it just comes constantly. And, you know, and, you know, 77 years and still happening. You see, this is, this is a process. It takes a long time, I tell you. You people are lucky because you're young. And you have a long time to go. But I am reaching to that level. And still, every morning, you see. So... The heavens are trying to dial in. Yes, I know. I know. So, now it's interesting that love is accompanied by a universal consciousness. You you cannot have self-centered consciousness and to be loving. Love and universal consciousness come together. The more we love, the more universal we become. Okay? Abdul Baha was that universal entity. You know? He encompassed everybody and everything. So the process of loving, as we evolve in the process of loving, meaning letting go of self. As we do that, we also become simultaneously conscious of the spiritual realities that are there. Conscious of humanity, conscious of suffering of humanity, conscious of the vagaries of human nature, conscious of everything that is happening. And On the wings of these two things, love and consciousness, we then 
begin to have begin to start our journey of eternity because we human beings by virtue of being human beings having soul our soul we are on the journey of eternity okay and because we are on a journey of eternity we have to have wings to fly to to go to because otherwise we will be stuck you know in the same way that in the womb of mothers many moments of uh, coming together of the sperm and ovum happens but most of them never reach to the point of a human being they somehow disappear and then one entity evolves okay in this world also many people don't take advantage of embarking on the journey of eternity and they get stuck in this journey see here we want to go on a journey of eternity and we say in our prayers make my prayer oh my lord a fountain of living waters whereby i may live as long as thy sovereignty endures right journey of eternity and make make mention of thee in every word of thy words in order to go on the journey of eternity we need the two wings of love selfless love and universal consciousness this is the process that we we work Now, in order to do that, in order to become selfless, one of the fundamental challenges that we have is the process of dealing with our will, submission of our will. Because human will is a very marvelous gift and a very dangerous gift human will is that power that makes us to choose the direction of our life and our journey of eternity okay and the fundamental task of a spiritualization of development of that pure love is the ability to bring our will in submission to the will of god which is submission to the will of the manifestation which is submission to the teachings of the manifestation to the revelation but it is a, a process that has to be done consciously deliberately freely it, is, it has to be choice we have to choose to do it and because it is difficult to do it the only entity that we can ask for help in that process is god himself so in the prayer we ask for that and we we say for example this transgressor seeking the ocean of thy forgiveness this lowly one the court of thy glory this poor creature the orient of thy wealth thine is the authority to command you see why this is so important for us at this juncture 
in human history because we are all living in the final stages of collective adolescence of humanity. We are all adolescents. And adolescents say, I am not going to obey anyone. Nobody is going to tell me what to do. I know what I'm going to do. I know what is the best thing to do. I'm not going to obey anybody. I'm not going to obey the laws of God. I'm not going to do any of those. I'm going to do what I want to do. Look around the world and to see what humanity is doing. Right? These, these are reflections of the mindset of the adolescent humanity that actually has gone in the wrong direction. And the outcome is devastation. This is what has happened. We, when we say these prayers, we are asking God to help us to move from our adolescent mindset, adolescent way of thinking, adolescent way of feeling, the adolescent way of acting, to the next level the next level of maturity, maturity, which is the level of humility, which is the level of submission, which is the level of letting go of self and becoming more and more selfless. See, and this prayer, we say it every day because we have to add to it, to this process of accomplishment in this path, a little bit every day. You can't let go. It's, it's a long task. It has to be done. Now, as we do that in the prayer, we are doing this in the prayer, as we proceed through the prayer, gradually we see that in the first parts of the prayer, the emphasis is on our on our self and how we have to become selfless. In the second part of the prayer, second half of prayer, the emphasis becomes on love because we are making mo movement now. And therefore, the tone of the second part changes dramatically. You see, for example, we say, Thou seest, O oh my God, how my spirit had been stirred up within my limbs and members in its longing to worship thee and its yearning to remember thee and extol thee. So what you're talking about? You're in love now, right? You're expressing our love. You are now, we have let go a little bit of, bit of ourselves. Now we are able to express more love. And we are now talking with our beloved. And as we do that, our talk with our beloved is going to become more and more specific. We are going to, uh, you know, remember how you, when the only one that we really open our, our hearts to is our loved one, okay? It is very difficult to open our hearts to strangers. And, and because in life, we seldom can establish that kind of a love relationship that we can totally, completely open our hearts. Most of the people in life feel unfulfilled with respect to love. <coughs> okay, this is condition of humanity. And, but when we communicate with our beloved God, we can totally open our heart. We can say whatever we want. Okay? So, so what we, did, we say? Here we are.
He say, O oh Lord of all beings, we are in love now. Remember, we have reached to the second level. O oh Lord of all beings and possessor of all things visible and invisible, thou dost perceive my tears and the sighs I utter and hearest my groaning and my wailing and the lamentations of my heart. Now this is a rough talk, isn't it? Who else we can talk to like this? If we do it with anybody else, they laugh at us. They say, what kind of a person you are? What are you talking about? The only one that you can talk to, the only loved one, beloved, that you can talk to in this manner is God. Okay? So we say it. We say it every day. We say, thou dost perceive my tears and my sighs, the sighs I utter. And here is my groaning and my wailing and the lamentations of my heart. And then we begin to confess to our beloved. By thy might, my trespasses, trespasses have kept me back from drawing nigh unto thee. And my sins have held me far from the court of thy holiness. Thy love, O oh my Lord, hath enriched me, and separation from thee hath destroyed me, and remoteness from thee hath consumed me. See what's happening? You see what you're doing now with your beloved? You see? We acknowledge our imperfection. We acknowledge our sin. We acknowledge of those and we acknowledge our love and we acknowledge that we are separated. There is a distance between us and our beloved. Okay? And we want to get closer and closer and we know what has done to us is separation. This is the way you talk with your beloved. Okay? So you see how the prayer moves from focusing on becoming selfless Hopefully, gradually, we enter in that space. And then we can begin to express our love. Because by doing that, a, a connection takes place. A realization takes place. And, of course, we know. Let's continue that. And then we say, oh, God, my God, my back is bowed. By the burden of my sins, my heedlessness had destroyed me. Whenever I ponder my evil doings and thy benevolence, my heart melted within me, and my blood boiled in my veins. By thy beauty, O thou, the desire of the world, I blush to lift up my face to thee, and my longing hands are ashamed to stretch forth towards the heaven of thy bounty. You see, we are going back to selflessness. We are through this process of love, we are trying to let go more and more of our insistent self and to become more and more selfless. We, de we do this process. And then it's fascinating what happens to close to the end of the prayer, is that we are given a glimpse of how we are going to resolve this condition and become more perfect, because we want to enter our heaven. You remember the Bob said, the heaven of everything is when we enter our state of perfection. And because in human beings, the state of perfection never can be accomplished, is ever moving towards that state. Okay? So that's the reason that we are on the journey of eternity. You see? If we, we could become perfect and say, okay, I'm perfect now, that's it. 
there's no purpose to live anymore, right? Mm -hmm. If all of us, if any of us, say, well, I'm perfect. Imagine, if you were perfect, there's no point to live. You be. He's a perfect example. So he doesn't stop living because he's perfect. No, he doesn't mean, Abdul Baha himself says that he is sinful. Read the obligatory prayer, the, the prayer visitation of Abdul Baha. You see, prayer visit, visitation of Abdul Baha, he says, say this prayer and it is exactly as though you are meeting Abdul Baha. And when we read that, we see that it's a prayer with fundamental, profound level of humbleness, okay, humility, and desire to serve the servants of God, okay? And Abdul Baha, when you go through his prayer, he constantly says, we are all sinful, okay? So Abdul Baha, vis-a-vis the journey of eternity is a different process, okay? And Abdul Baha also, Baha'u'llah has said that he is the mystery of God. We, we wouldn't understand it, okay? We wouldn't understand it. There is no point try to understand Abdul Baha. The only point that we can do is to emulate, to learn from his example of love. And how does he show his love to God? by serving humanity, right? So, and what is, what is his fundamental focus of service? Is to create love and unity among masses of humanity. And what's the purpose of that love and unity that he tries to create? Abdul Baha said, I came to the West to create, to promote peace, right? Baha'u'llah, when uh, Edward Brown went to visit Baha'u'llah, what Baha'u'llah said, he said, our purpose is to remove the causes of conflict among people and bring about the most great peace. And Baha'u'llah said, is not that you wish to have in the West? To have peace, you see? so." The love of God has to be translated into action. And the action has to be all conducive to create the states of unity, harmony, and peace. Why? Because the force of unity, the fuel of unity, is love. When you have love, automatically you create unity. And when you create unity, automatically you bring about peace. You see, these are all totally integrated in each other. So, so in the end of the prayer, Baha'u'llah says, we, we say to Baha'u'llah, we say, praise be thou, Praise be unto thee, O our God, that thou hast sent down unto us that which draweth us nigh unto thee, and supplieth us with every good thing sent down by thee in thy books and thy scriptures. Okay? So Baha'u'llah assures us that whatever is needed for this journey of eternity are sent down. They are here. We have it. Okay. And then he said, protect us, we beseech thee, O my Lord, from the hosts of idle fancies and vain imaginings. And if you read the writings of the faith, which you have had many times, when you will see that the idea of being free from vain imaginings and idle fancies is repeated over and over in the writings of the Baha'i faith. 
because humanity lives with idle fancies and vain imaginings. Humanity doesn't function according to fundamentals of human. It's all vain imaginings and idle fancies. And we ask that we be protected from vain imaginings and idle fancies. What the religions are doing against each other right now, Muslims, Christians, Hindus, name it, all of them, is because they are totally in the clutches of their vain imaginings and idle fancies. What different ideological systems of the world, communism and Marxism and capitalism and all of them do, these are all idle fancies and vain imaginings. They don't allow themselves to be freed from that because, because idle fancies and vain imaginings always are a mixture of facts, fictions, and selfish desires. <coughs> An idle imagining and fancy is a mixture of some facts, some fictions, and all wishes, selfish wishes. In other words, we want to believe what we want to believe. That's what it is. And free, well, we ask for how long, at the end of our long obligatory prayer, to protect us from that. So that we can embark upon the independent investigation of truth in every aspect of life. Okay, dear friends, I think that's sufficient for tonight. Thank you very much. Yeah,